Welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Now, this week we speak with Catherine Adair, who has the daunting task of bringing Kenya's Silicon Valley into being. Konza City is the project that she heads, and she gives us her insights into Africa. We get your views on the issues as well. And as always, we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Geshuru. Dr. Catherine Adair is the Acting Chief Executive Officer of the CONSA Technopolis Development Authority, the agency that's responsible for spearheading the development of Konza Techno City in Kenya. She's a widely published information scientist in the field of information and communication technologies for development, with over 20 years of experience working with international organizations and governments. Prior to leading Konza Technopolis, she served as the Vision Sector Director for Business Process Outsourcing Information Technology Enabled Services at the Ministry of Information and Communications in Kenya. Dr. Adair has served on the boards of the Kenya ICT Board, Mobile for Good and Computers for Schools Kenya. She was the chairperson of the Consumer Awareness Task Force in the Kenyan government's Digital Migration Committee. She serves on the editorial board for Journal of Perspectives on Global Development and Technology. Let's get straight to her insights on Africa. Catherine, welcome to the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Thank you. You had an exciting project it certainly must be a challenge as well konza city which is meant to be the silicon valley of, of kenya possibly east africa and maybe even the continent how's that going um julie I'm, I'm, thank you very much first of all for giving me this opportunity to be able to chat with you about konza konza is now going it it's, was not it's going moving. before it's, it's moving. moving it's uh -huh. moving yeah it's been quite a challenge and sometimes even i have had doubts whether this project, we're going to see this project to fruition, but now I believe in it more and more. Uh, the challenge with Konza has been that initially there was so much advertising without real work uh, on the ground, and some of the critical factors that were needed, things like approvals had not been done, but now I can say with certainty, we got the most important approval, which was the NEMA approval, and NEMA are so stringent. Mm -hmm. I mean, just uh, looking at things like, what is your solid waste plan? How much water do you have for this kind of tech city? And they're looking at it in standards of what they consider tech cities. And simple things like, what are you going to do about the animals that used to just cross over in that particular right. land? Are you going to keep a natural animal migratory corridor? And sometimes people want to take shortcuts. We would have taken shortcuts on some of these things last year. But I decided that we need to comply by the law. And my board decided we must comply by the law. So we've made sure we did everything that NEMA wanted. With the NEMA approval, it opens doors for everything else that we've been talking about in Konza. So yeah. let's talk about when you hit the ground running and, and where you are right now in terms of the process of um, working with partners, critical partners like mobile service providers or the actual um, hardware providers? What, in terms of partnerships, where are you? In terms of partnerships, we've always had a lot of interest. I actually have a database of people who've expressed interest, be it in uh, IT, uh, telecommunications, as you're talking about, real estate. Mm -hmm. But most of them wanted to start some work, but they couldn't start any work on the ground. But oh, I've tried to keep up uh, with them, but some of them have gone to other projects. Mm -hmm. Because you see, they're, they're not only looking at Kenya. These are, some of them are coming from overseas. They want to invest in Africa. If you're taking too long, they will Rwanda is knocking next door. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghana is, no, is knocking. And that's what people don't understand. When somebody comes and they've got a good product, you need to give them the enabling environment. So right now, it's more exciting because even as we've publicized that we've got the name approval, we are starting the cadastral survey, which should be starting in the next week or so, just to show them what parcels of land they can use. The partners have started expressing interest, interest again. And at least now I can also talk with confidence and tell them this is, what, this is how we are going to engage. This is the timeline 
from now because from last year, for the last two years, I think, uh, well, I've been mostly involved in the last one and a half years. Uh, some of the partners, you know, they, they, they ask you after every two or three months, when are we because starting? Because they're keen when and they're starting? eager. They're keen, yes. but they almost look like they're trying to do for you a favor and it's supposed to be the other way around. We need them. Mm. And this is both global and uh, uh, local. We lost a number of uh, very interested um, international investors uh, just before the elections because mm. they were a bit worried about what would happen to Kenya, the uncertainty. But after the elections uh, was, went smoothly and things were very uh, quiet, some of them have expressed interest again, which I'm very glad about. But then they, they also can't wait too long. So it's that kind of engagement which requires some very aggressive PR. What are the gaps in government? And, and you're trying to build a city that's going to be highly efficient, that's going to draw in you know, private sector players. What are your challenges in, in, in government or in dealing with government to push this vehicle forward? And as I say this, I have to say to the smile on my face because I'm also government <laughs> <laughs> in many ways. But yes. it's, I've had a lot of frustrations. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I say, I think the frustrations stem from the fact that many people also don't understand. They don't understand the kind of smart city we are talking about. The kind of tech city. People are just thinking, oh, they've seen this. Somebody went and benchmarked in Cyberjai in Malaysia or something else. But they need to understand how those work. For example, I mean, the vision I have for Konza is when you see like water gushing out somewhere in Nairobi, who do you report to? Mm -hmm. How do you even control that? But right now with the smart cities and some of the solutions that are there, we are going to, we are going to be using technology in Konza. We should be able to monitor the way water is running the city. We should be able to get a warning when there's a problem somewhere, a burst pipe. We should be able to get there and sort it out. And actually we want in that little locality called Konza to be able to use the smartest technologies for everything, be it water distribution, be it uh, electricity. And that's what I'm trying to get people in government to understand. But some of them think this is business as usual. Why are you even going for foreigners? Why are you getting a foreign consultant to come and oversee the implementation of We can do we can, we we can, can do, do it locally. Yeah, but you you're can, saying no, no, this is a different standard. Yeah, because I don't want a situation where, when I, when I talk, for example, about shared infrastructure, um, I'm, uh, I'm talking about things like, why should somebody dig a road? Then uh, tomorrow, no, somebody puts a cable. Then tomorrow you come to dig it out so that you can put a uh, uh, sort out your road. Tomorrow somebody else comes and digs, digs it out because they need to put a water pipe. Why can't we have, you know, smart city thinking, a little tunnel with everything there so you plan together. These people should be working together. So C Catherine, you've, you've worked in the UN system, you've engaged with Habitat, you, you're, you're very informed on human development issues. L let's ask this question, isn't it a shame that even now as we build Konza, you have to say, we don't have the internal capacity to do these things. We have to look externally. And what must we do as, as countries and as a continent to move away from this? Julie, in fact, one of the things I would even like to correct is the perception that we don't have uh, the internal capacity. Sometimes the people are there. We even have some people who come from the diaspora. I know some excellent graduates right from here, Harvard, who are back home. But because they're not on the government's pre-qualified list, because they cannot, uh, they, they cannot bid for the tenders, the way some of those tenders are structured in government, they just, they're just not bothered. They cut themselves out. Yet they're there. Their brains are there. So we are forced to sometimes go outside so that we can comply with the tender and the procurement system. I hear you. So the brains are there. The brains are there. And we can combine these brains. Of, of course, they're, maybe they're not enough, but we do have somewhere to start. So what can you do to lobby, especially as you are part of government, albeit heading a project that is unique? Um, how can you lobby to say, hold on a minute, as we do this, let's start to draw back those great minds who now have been lost to the country and are working in other environments? I, I think one of the ways is even just to engage with them. Because I remember even when we started this uh, Konza project, at, no, not when we started, I joined the Konza project, uh, I think in 2012, uh, March. And at that point, one of the critical groups I said we really need to talk to is the Architectural Association of Kenya. Just talking to them. But you see, some of, engaging with some of these professionals, be they the, uh, the engineers, be they the IT people, is, 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 is one critical way to go. But the other thing is for the government to understand um, I don't want to lose, uh, I, I've understood your question, but I also don't want to lose this point, is 
just to rethink about how we, we, we build these tenders, what the procurement uh, requires, because sometimes we really do discourage these people. I ask some of them, why don't you follow up some of these things? They say it is so hard, and then mm. it is so difficult to get paid. And then the payment plans, you find that you're, al you're always chasing after you've done the work. And then some of the people you're engaging with uh, are, are supposed to be evaluating you when they don't fully understand what, what it is you're doing. So they, uh, some, they get discouraged because they've got other work they would rather be doing rather than spend time arguing over something which they know is factually correct. If, for example, they tell you this is how. You should, uh, uh, you should make the roads in a smart city. You should have in enough uh, pavements for bicycle lanes and stuff like that. And you tell them, no, in Kenya, this is the way it's done. So you, 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 you kick somebody out because you want to stick to the way you've done it mm. from 1963. Mm. It cannot happen like that. Let's go to education. And, and you know, there's been uh, some concern over the years, but perhaps maybe not enough concern that we're not growing enough engineers, we're not growing enough scientists, we're not doing enough research and development. What are your thoughts on those issues? Doctors, very, doctors, I mean, you know. No, you are very, very correct. I mean, we've taken, we take, for example, even when we think about uh, how much money we allocate to uh, research and development, we don't take it seriously. We are here, sometimes you hear people talking of where Kenya was in 1965 and, and South Korea. The, I mean, uh, the Republic of Korea, oh, okay, South Korea, where we were, we were exactly at the same place. But what did they do right? They, they put in money into innovation, into research and development. And research and development is not something you put in money today and you want success the same day. You see, in Kenya, we, uh, in Kenya, we don't like failure. If somebody fails over something, we, we, we criticize them and we cut them out. Or, or yeah. is it a need for immediate gratification? We want to yeah. see results instant, now? Instant. We want instant coffee. We want instant tea. We want instant. And that's why even somebody was joking with me and told me that uh, the wine in Kenya, we want wine that matures overnight. We don't want the wine to sit somewhere like in South Africa. And, quality, quality. and the quality is lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're not taking R&D seriously. And even some, some of our policies don't take this into consideration. So what, then, what happens then is, uh, in terms of education, even the quality of graduates uh, are wanting. If you talk to many of the people in industry, yes, we're graduating many students. At one time, when I studied in Kenya in the late 80s, it was about people were excited, uh, 10,000 graduates. Then we start talking of business process outsourcing and all that, and we start saying we're competing with India. India has got like about a million graduates. So then Kenya, now we expand our universities, we have everything. Now we've got about 100,000 graduates. Is it about the number of graduates or the quality of the graduates? The quality of the education. Yeah, and the I quality of the education. That's what we should be thinking about, and our professors have to take it more seriously. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. And the, the good news is that, you know, Africans do care about education. And, and we do want to push our children as far as we possibly can. And, and so at least we've got those fundamentals right. But it's about having the system in place to ensure its quality that we're, we're churning out. In fact, Julia, allow me to give you an example. Um, I, I came uh, to California, University of Southern California in 2005 uh, for a fellowship. I was doing part of my postdoctoral studies. And uh, we came up with a, gr a great idea of having some seminar-driven classes with Egypt and Kenya and all that. And I came back home because we were trying to engage with the graduates. And uh, I, t I tried talking to professors, University of Nairobi. I tried going around and I was telling them, could I just have, I want to develop a, a class on IT and development, but it's completely seminar driven and it's practical where we take a student to Nakumat and just tell them, stand at the corner, just look at how they're operating on the till and then use your technology brain and tell me, how can we make that more efficient? Right. They really didn't want to listen no to me. No interest. No. And, 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 and I found that difficult because at the end of the, some of the professors were willing to listen, but then they've, they've got to, they said, you have to wait for Senate, you have to wait for that. Have the yeah. academics let us down? Be bold. <laughs> I, I see you want to say something, but... <laughs> because many of them are my friends. <laughs> yes, but, but, but truth be told, do we need academics to, and, and this could actually be something that politically was an environment created mm. to keep 
the system from changing. And, and I think we know during the Moy era, it was very difficult for academics. Yeah. But do we need academics to start thinking differently? We do. I mean, here in the US, see how they really engage their academics. When there's any serious issue, we are only engaging our academics mostly in politics. We are not dealing with other issues. And yet we have the brains there. And even them, I do blame them. Because most of them are very comfortable in their little ivory towers, doing their research, getting their money, and just teaching their students. They're not out there, you know, discussing with people. Like when I'm saying some of these things that are not going right in Konza, I'd like some of the academics who've done this research and all that to come and say, And yes, give you a paper support me. and say, here you go. Give me you a paper go. and tell me, yes, you are right. <laughs> right. Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley, but it fa there's some failures in Silicon Valley which we can make sure we leapfrog and maybe do it differently. So uh, like somebody was asking me yesterday, are you trying to replicate Silicon Valley? We are not. But what can we learn from Silicon mm -hmm. Valley? And that's why my academics can also help me, the academics in the country. But they're not, they're just quiet. So who do you have making noise about Konza? The entrepreneurs and everybody else. So challenge to the academics. We want <laughs> you to actively engage, share those brains with us. Um, come out of the shell, I, th I think is, 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 is what we're saying. Um, let's, let's move to our vision, our ambition as a continent. We're here at Harvard Business School for the Africa Business Conference. And yesterday, someone challenged you and said, this vision of yours, this dream of yours, this project <coughs> cannot be done. What's your response to naysayers? No, I, 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 I took the challenge and I was so happy about it because number one, they said, so many similar projects are coming up in Africa that why are you all trying to build a Silicon uh, Valley? You've got other needs. You need to make sure you have water for your people. I mean, they, they went back to the, the all the negative things. You need to have electricity. Food, you water. need to have food. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I'm saying is, and who says we don't need to have something like uh, the Silicon Savannah? And the reason why, uh, uh, I mean, when I look at Konza, Konza is not something that's going to be built today. But it's a dream that we are actually working towards building because we need it. Where are many of our, where, where are many of our young people going? There's all these, uh, I, I, the, the fantastic IT brains. You go to Rwanda, that is doing something. They've got a small, uh, they've got a small project. Where they go to Ethiopia, go to South Africa. Who do you mostly find there? A lot of the people there are Kenyans. And when you're building Konza also, I, what I also told them is Konza is not just for Kenyans. Mm. Konza is for all of them uh, in, in Africa. And uh, the f they were just looking at it like Silicon Valley and they were looking at the huge amounts of money. And I said, no, that's not even what I'm thinking about. Even if we just have an anchor university, we just set up Konza right. This is the way to go. Why do we only want to think? I mean, even I, I remember about uh, 10 or 15 years ago when I was saying that it's so important. I, when I was doing my PhD research, I was saying it's so important to have computers. All lecturers should be able to have computers. They should be able to use them. And you know, just things like that. And, 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 and even and to say, that, there's resistance. Yeah, at that even time, to that. No, I remember at that time, Julia was told, those are not the priorities that Kenya needs. The priorities we need is to be able to feed the people and all that. Now tell me. Everybody even walks around with a laptop right now. Mm -hmm. And what I was visualizing is we need to engage with these new technologies. And we're saying we can't. And that's the same thing I see with Konza. Sometimes we don't want to dream big, and we have to. Sometimes we have to dream big. We have big. to dream big, and we have to be ambitious. And we're not doing this for ourselves, we're doing it for our children. You know, the African Union has a vision of, of a 2053 that were 2063 that will be an amazing time for Africa, that we will have overcome many of the challenges that we're seeing. We will be the go-to continent. Um, if indeed projects like Konza succeed, if we do start to think big, but also address the smaller issues and the fundamental challenges we have, what kind of Africa? could we be? Just think about it. It's going to be the kind of place where everybody will want to come. Right now, everybody wants to come west. If you're back home, everybody thinks, oh, there's always something better. I would say, the streets paved with gold, the land of opportunity. I would like, in fact, when you talk of 2053, I'm even thinking sooner. I'm thinking that by, by even 2030, 2040, people will be saying, the land of opportunity. Africa, the land of opportunity, Kenya. There's nothing more for me here. That's where I want to settle. 
not just to visit, to settle. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's going to happen. But of course, as you say, some of those small things, the bureaucracy, the belief, and also not too much focus on politics all the time. We really must get some development going. And that's why we need the government to support even initiatives like this and be even the brand ambassadors when they go out. Mm -hmm. Because if it, it's not just us who should be defending such initiatives. It should come from everybody. Everybody should be saying Konza is the place to go. And see the value. Yeah, in and it. see and the value. And like what the Ghanaians are doing with their Hope City. But then you look at Konza, everybody tells me Konza is so well planned. Konza is so well thought out. But we need to keep hearing that as people go outside. Tell us, groundbreaking. This is the final, final question. <laughs> groundbreaking, actual on the ground movement, foundations, action, when? Julie, in a couple of months. Right now, it's, in a way, it's groundbreaking because we're starting the cadastral survey, which is demarcating the parcels in phase one of Konza, the 400 acres, right. with the beacons so that people can know where the roads are going to be, the water is going to be. And once the, we finish the cadastral survey in the next two months, the roads, people should be able to come and start dealing with the roads and uh, the water. And the only challenge is I am praying we can sign the, co the consultants who own the master de 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 uh, development partner too, so that we can have people who are experts in smart cities overseeing this. But in the next couple of months, there should be more activity. That I can promise you, Julie. Thank you. With the support of the government. Thank you, government. <laughs> Thank you. We hope you're all listening and the, and the country, the region is the certainly region. watching. Finally, please look into the, the camera here and give your message to the leadership and the citizenry of the continent? Uh, the most important thing for the leadership is you have to believe in your own projects. And to believe in your own projects means you have to make sure the resources are available, you have to make sure the, uh, I mean, cut off some of the, uh, too much of the bureaucracy and just make sure our projects come to fruition and make the Kenyans believe that you desire to make, uh, like a Konza, to build Konza and to the citizens work with us. Uh, this is not for Kenyans alone, it's for the whole of Africa, and Konza is for you. And engage, with, uh, the, don't be embarrassed to even call someone like me. I'll even share with Julie my email, if it's <laughs> although I, I, I'm sure I'll get hordes of email, but this is for you, because the ideas, we may have the ideas, but I believe there are even more ideas out there to just make sure that this project sees the light of the day. We want a Silicon Savannah, not necessarily Silicon Valley, but something similar. And I'm sure out there, there are people who can make sure that this sees the light of day. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Africa's Silicon Valley, a big challenge, but we can certainly do it. What do you think though? Do you believe in it? What's the way forward? Let's get your views on the issues. This week we asked you, what are the factors that impede technological advancement in Africa? William Radido says, Factors that slow technological advancement and hinder its improvement in Africa include donor funding, poor governmental approach to technological advancement, African countries taking long to embrace technology in their activities and most budgets prepared in African countries delegate low amount of money for technological improvement. Bet Robert says, the absence of flexibility towards embracing technological advancement. Africa needs a paradigm shift. Hi, my name is Tius Bogo, watching the African Leadership Dialogues from Nairobi, Kenya. I believe there are quite a number of things or other factors that impede technological advancement in Africa. One of them being politics. Politics is a major deterrent to our advancement. Because you realize that most of the most of the political policies that are set there are not in line with our development agenda priorities, and so if we can avoid them, then I believe we can see to it that we achieve our goals. Another thing is economy. Our economy is growing, but then we don't input so much into helping the young minds come up with more creative stuff. And I believe if we, if we can if we can prioritize on that, then at least we can see Africa moving forward. But all in all, the way we are going is not really bad per se, but more can be done. Thank you. 
To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254 715 816033 Time now for Africa's top 10. This week on Africa's top 10, we focus on technological cities being built in Africa. Starting us off at number 10 is West Cape in South Africa, a planned community of 800,000 that promises to help alleviate Cape Town's dire shortage of affordable housing and is conceived as a fully autonomous community with educational, civic, health, commercial and industrial amenities as well as a transport network integrated into that of Cape Town. At number 9 is Smart Village in Cairo, Egypt. The first stage of the Smart Village was inaugurated in September 2003. It includes a communication center, business service center, conference center and technological incubators which support new small businesses and small investors in the field of technology. Coming in at number 8 is the Bene Cyber City in Mauritius. Construction began in November 2001 with the city promoted as a new IT and a link between African and Asian markets. Ibin is also a cable landing point of the safe high-speed submarine communications cable between South Africa and Malaysia and home of Afrinic, a regional internet registry for Africa and other IT companies. Taking the number 7 spot is Kigali City. The capital and biggest city of Rwanda has launched an ambitious urban development plan to transform into the center of urban excellence in Africa. The bold and radical 2020 Kigali Conceptual Master Plan includes all the hallmarks of a regional hub for business, trade and tourism. It envisages Singapore-like commercial and shopping districts boasting glass box skyscrapers as well as green-themed parks. Hope City in Ghana comes in at number 6, a 10 billion US dollar high-tech hub positioned outside Accra, aiming to turn Ghana into a major ICT player. Hope City will house 25,000 residents and create jobs for 50,000 people. It will be made up of six towers of different dimensions, including a 75-story, 270-meter-high building that is expected to be the highest in Africa. At number 5 is La Cité du Fleuve in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a luxurious housing project planned for two islands of the Congo River in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo and one of Africa's fastest growing cities. Developer Hokut Properties plans to reclaim about 375 hectares of sandbanks and swamps to build thousands of riverside villas, offices and shopping centers over the next 10 years. Tattoo City in Kenya comes in at number 4. The city will span 1,035 hectares, 15 kilometers from the capital Nairobi. It is designed to create a new decentralized urban center to the north of the bustling Kenyan capital. Construction began last May and in spite of several setbacks, the project is projected to be completed in 10 phases by 2022. When finalized, the mixed-use satellite city is expected to become home of 77,000 residents. Positioned at number 3 is Echo Atlantic, Nigeria. Echo Atlantic is a multi-billion dollar residential and business development that will be located on Victoria Island in Lagos along its upmarket Bar Beach coastline. The ambitious project is being built on 10 square kilometers of land reclaimed from the Atlantic Ocean. Echo Atlantic is expected to provide upscale accommodation for 250,000 people and employment opportunities for a further 150,000. At number 2 is Apollonia City and King City in Ghana. Apollonia and King City will be located in Greater Accra and Western Ghana respectively. The mixed-use satellite cities are expected to accommodate more than 160,000 residents on land developed for housing properties, retail and commercial centers, as well as schools, healthcare and other social amenities. And at number one this week is Konza City in Kenya. Dubbed as Africa's Silicon Savannah, 
and a flagship of the Kenyan government. Konza Techno City is a mega project designed to foster the growth of the country's technology industry. The multi-billion dollar city, located on 5,000 acres, 60 kilometers southeast of the capital Nairobi, aims to create nearly 100,000 jobs by 2030. It will feature a central business district, a university campus, urban parks and housing to accommodate 185,000 people. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. Creating various Silicon Valleys across Africa is not going to be an easy task, but it's one that must be achieved with all the creative talent and potential of young Africans in particular. This could be a key driver of change when it comes to creating opportunities. And so on that note, we end with a proverb that helps put things in perspective for all of us. And it goes. Do not let what you cannot do tear your hands from what you can. This Ashanti proverb reminds us that we can all do something. And while some tasks may seem too difficult, let's get busy trying the ones we believe that we can do. And each step forward is a step ahead. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa. <laughs>